Now for our politics panel. Susan Page is USA Today's Washington Bureau Chief. Clarence Page is a columnist with the Chicago Tribune. Amy Davidson is a staff writer and contributor for The New Yorker. And Ron Fournier is a senior political columnist for the National Journal and the author of a new book, Love That Boy. Susan Page, start with you. Uh, who has the better argument between Donald Trump and Reince Priebus about the Republican nominating process? Well, Reince is, Priebus is technically correct. You know, the rules have been in place for a long time, so read the rules and know what they're going. But, you know, Donald Trump has a very powerful political message to make here, which is if, he, if he's gotten the most votes, if he's gotten the most delegates, why in the world would you deny him the nomination? And this is the dilemma, I think, for the Republicans. They have two bad choices. They can nominate Trump and lose a lot of traditional Republicans who find him unacceptable. They cannot nominate Trump and they'll lose his supporters. I don't think they have a really good option here. Yeah, Amy Davidson, when Reince Priebus explains the rules, as Susan says, he's walking through well-established party rules. But sometimes, you know, when you look at things in the light of a new day, it seems, uh, you know, Reince Priebus said he can rest in the truth. I don't know if he's that restful right now. <laughs> he didn't look restful. I think one thing that Trump has going for him in this argument is that it fits so well with the general case he's been making, that things are rigged, that it's corrupt. He's basically worked on the assumption that, that you can't tell American people, the American people enough that the political system is corrupt, that he, he explains his, his contributions to Democrats by saying, I was a builder in New York, I had to buy them off. And it's, it works for him because it doesn't contradict anything that his supporters like about him. Clarence, one thing Donald Trump has been doing in addition to making this claim about the Republican Party is he's kind of retooled a little bit his campaign. I don't know. What do you make of it? What do, you, do you think that's... Well, he's, he's found the need to retool because he did not have much of a ground game, for example. Uh, Ted Cruz has found a distinct advantage in a number of states uh, by uh, having people there to, to uh, uh, roust up votes for him. Uh, and delegates for him, even uh, though, uh, as we know uh, by now, the uh, delegates and the votes are not necessarily connected, <laughs> or at least not in the way most people might think. And that's why Reince Priebus is running into this problem now, and, and why Trump has something of an argument. Much like in 2000 during the Florida debacle, or 1968 when Hubert Humphrey got the nomination without having the votes in the primaries, uh, that's, that's the sort of thing that hits the voters by surprise. And they say, oh, it, it is rigged. It must be rigged. I don't understand it. It must be rigged. Mm -hmm. And so this gives uh, Trump some, uh, some uh, 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 attraction right. with that argument. Ron, what do you make of... You've covered so many presidents. As a candidate, what does this tell us, Donald Trump's approach to this other complicated business? What does it tell us about him as, as a potential president? What are we learning about his skills? Uh, that he'll do anything he can and say anything he can to get what he wants. Um, he's a very bottom line, Machiavellian guy. Uh, but he's also tapped into something that's real out there. People understand that politics really needs to be reformed. And let's talk about the arc of reform here on this specific instance. Mm -hmm. Up until the 1970s, everything was, was picked. All nominees were picked by a bunch of white men in smoke-filled rooms. Since the 70s, as, as historian Matthew Dalek wrote about today in the Washington Post, we've had a sensible blend of voters participating and making their voices known and men in, mostly men in smoke-filled rooms making a decision, at least the establishment. I think going forward, what Trump is tapping into, what Bernie Sanders is tapping into, is the public believes in evolution, at least in political evolution. And going forward, we need to have a more democratic, more accessible, more transparent process for nominating candidates, or these parties are no longer going to be relevant. So if you want to be a relevant party, a millennial party, you need to find a different way to nominate people who are going to be leading your party. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can that be done, Susan, while you're also actually trying to put a convention together? I mean... That yeah, seems good like luck an with awfully that. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, one thing that Ryan's previous said that I think is is actually not entirely um, accurate or a little misleading is that the rules are up to the convention. Well, that's true in the end, but the, the RNC Rules Committee is meeting this week in Hollywood, Florida, and they could send to the convention rules committee, which is a separate body, different rules. And in fact, right. I think we may see a really fierce battle that begins this week in Florida over do we use the House of Representatives rules or do we use Robert's Rules of Orders? How easy would it be to open the nomination to people who did not compete in the primaries? This fight is going to start really soon. And we're going to get, go ahead. Amy. And the key thing on that is that the delegates, even if they're pledged to Trump in theory, are not pledged to him on rules questions, only on the nomination question. 
So a Trump delegate can, even before the balloting starts, vote against Trump's interests. And you know who's focused on who's getting on that rules committee is the Cruz campaign. Just yep. as they've been focused on delegate selection process in a way that the Trump campaign is not, they are focused on who's going to be sitting on that important rules committee that on the 18th starts to, decides what rules that convention will, will abide by. I know. For a senator whose colleagues say he doesn't know about how to play strategy, he's played the backroom <laughs> part of this game very well. You were how about this for a little irony? Right now, this weekend, Miami-Dade County, they're not using a smoke-filled room, but they're picking delegates in a cigar warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> Little throwback. Clarence, uh, Susan mentioned the idea of maybe another person coming in on the stage be based on the way the rules may be written. Paul Ryan, the House Speaker, tried to take himself off the stage this week. Mm -hmm. um, wh what did you make of that? It reminds me of that song, I Won't Dance, Don't Ask Me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, naturally, after, he sounds very much like he did when uh, uh, a lot of folks wanted him to run for Speaker of the House since they wasn't going to do it. And of course, we know he's now Speaker of the House. Uh, I think uh, it's important for Ryan personally uh, to uh, stay, uh, try to, to be an honest broker. He is Speaker of the House, and he may be called upon to uh, at least help resolve uh, the, the disputes that are rising now. Uh, and uh, I can't help but believe that if he was offered the presidential nomination, he would take it. Uh, however, a lot of folks say maybe it's too soon. He wants to wait uh, 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 because he, he's basically a moderate conservative, a pragmatic conservative. Uh, and, and that's what, what makes him very attractive right now. People try to find an alternative for the more ideological folks. Yeah, I mean, the best way for him to be a draft candidate on the third, fourth, or fifth ballot is to have behaved beforehand like he wasn't ever going to want to Then run. he's doing it for the country, he's doing it for the party. Somebody's got to get the nomination. If there's really a deadlock, then it's going to be going to be opened up. And he may say, I hate to do this, you made me. I actually think Paul Ryan means what he says. I don't think this is some calculated strategy on his part. And I think he's playing a longer game, which is whoever they nominate for president, he's going to be an alternative voice for what it is the Republican Party stands for. That is not a bad position to be in. And remember, he's also a young guy mm -hmm. uh, who mm -hmm. could run in four years, eight years, 12 years, when the situation may be a little less turbulent in the Republican Party. I trust uh, the House Speaker here, too. What I don't trust is that a unruly, angry, disruptive, desperate for change, a, a group of uh, convention delegates uh, would do anything conventional. Mm. I, I think that's right. I mean, his, his, his motives may be pure right now, but right. We, it may be on the ninth ballot where people are looking around and he's the only... And if not well, him, maybe what, somebody else who's not even in the mix right now. Remember what Mo Udall said in 1976? He said, if nominated, I'll move to Mexico. If elected, <laughs> I will fight extradition. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mo, best quotes ever in the business, Mo Udall. Uh, let's move now uh, to the Democrats here. Um, Ron, what's your sense of, does David, David Axelrod describe a situation in which Bernie Sanders has to, basically lightning has to strike for him. His supporters think that, that's, that that suggests the system is rigged. What's your feeling about where things really stand? Well, they're both right. Uh, David, mm -hmm. writes, uh, David Axelrod is right that we have to have a fundamental change um, in, in the race, whether it's um, something involving Secretary Clinton or lightning strikes with Bernie Sanders. And uh, Bernie Sanders people are right that the system is rigged. Now, this is the system he decided to run in. He wanted to run in a Democratic primary, which is, which is rigged towards the establishment. Um, again, in, in the 70s, uh, the Democratic Party became more Democratic in that primaries have a lot more power than they did before the 70s, but they didn't want to give up all the party to the people, or all the power to the people, so you still have these party establishments who get to vote for whoever they want, no matter how uh, the voters vote in their districts or in their states, and they, they're going to hold sway. Amy, mm. the, David Axelrod played down any sense of contention between the two candidates. A lot of other people this week spent a lot of time talking about how tough the battle and push and pull was between the two of them. Bernie Sanders certainly seems a little irritated in my conversation with him. What's your sense of where the Democratic race is now and how much lasting damage could be created between now and the convention? Well, a, a lot. But in terms of the superdelegates, it, it cuts both ways. There are so many superdelegates that it's basically very possible that Bernie Sanders can prevent Hillary Clinton from getting an absolute majority, the magic number, without any superdelegates, at which point he's said that, his campaign has said that they'll just treat that as a big primary that hasn't happened yet, a 700 delegate primary that's going to happen at the convention and really push it to then. So a lot is going to depend on how the Clinton campaign responds to his ideas about a party platform, about 
their direction and how they go after him. And if it's in a way that reinforces um, questions that the Sanders supporters have about her forthrightness, it could be quite damaging. Susan, one of the things that was brought up in the debate was um, the 1994 crime bill. Um, both uh, Bernie Sanders voted for it and Hillary Clinton supported it as a part of her husband's administration. Why are we talking about the 1994 crime bill? Because politics, have this, the position of the Democratic Party, the ideological position has really shifted right. to the left. And also because it's a different time, crime is much less of an issue now than it was in, in 1994. A lot of people lined up behind the 1994 crime bill. But look at what Hillary Clinton herself has described as the unintended consequences, which was the incarceration of so many African Americans, especially African American men. Attitudes toward that have changed, just as attitudes have changed in a significant way since the Bill Clinton administration on things like the Defense of Marriage Act. You know, there, there were a series of things that a moderate, centrist, democratic president did in the 1990s that don't look, uh, th that now are controversial in new ways when you look at the party in 2016. Clarence, one of the things that uh, Bernie Sanders said is in, he had criticized Bill Clinton for defending his wife, for using the mm -hmm. term super predator right. in the context of this debate in the 1990s. So he, and he said basically it was a racist term and everybody at the time knew it was a racist term. Is that right? No, everybody at the time, qu quite the opposite. Right. Uh, super predator was a term that, that John DiIulio, the sociologist at the University of Pennsylvania, came up with, uh, who uh, uh, by 1999 was regretting it uh, because uh, uh, he looked at the, at the numbers again and found that a new generation of super predator teenagers was not being created after all. In fact, crime went down among juveniles and adults uh, after the early 90s. Uh, but meanwhile, though, uh, even most of the Congressional Black Caucus, but about two votes, as I recall, supported the crime bill uh, and, and, and felt that something needed to be done. Uh, the, the problem was, you know, Diulio wanted a, a broad-based a group of reforms to try to prevent crime, turn young people away from crime. Uh, the Republican Congress at that time was more interested in punitive actions, and that's why uh, the uh, whole mass incarceration trend uh, uh, increased. Now, nowadays, Susan's right, you've got, you've got a, a, a cross-party coalition now of folks, even uh, what, what Ted Cruz and uh, Rand Paul, uh, who want to see uh, the, the cost, the high cost of, uh, of uh, incarceration and the ineffectiveness of it reversed. Uh, so it's, it's a different world now. You know, it's a, it's a policy matter. There are now tens of thousands of African Americans who are in jail right now under sentences that have been rolled back by Congress because of the crack, um, you know, you know, the, co the cocaine disparity. But they're still in jail because they weren't grandfathered. And with a stroke of the pen, a stroke of the pen, President Obama can free them. And for some reason hasn't. I mean, there's just been a few, 30 or 40. But there's, there's thousands of African Americans who are in jail under this old crime bill that now the, the Democratic Party um, is, is abhorrent to, but the Democratic liberal president, for some reason, hasn't used his executive clemency powers. I, I can't figure it out. Go ahead. Quickly. Another way that the, the, those debates in that whole super predator era has come up and might come up more is with actually Donald Trump, who one of his early forays into politics was in the case of the Central Park Five. He, That's right. These were 14, 15, and 16 year olds who were labeled super predators in that way and whose execution he called for uh, in an ad in the, in the Daily News. Um, he later, when they were exonerated, when they were shown to be innocent in the last year or two, has not regretted that at all, has said that they were you know, pulling a scam on the city. I want to just quickly before we leave here, um, mention, Ron, your new book, Love Thank That you. Boy. Tell us qu uh, quickly about where the title comes from. There's a political tune to it, and we're going to talk about this later on the web. But Thank you. When my son was five, he had a quirky, um, awkward encounter with President um, Bush. My son was quirky and, and, uh, and, uh, and awkward because he uh, has Asperger's syndrome, a wonderful quirky condition. I mean, President uh, Bush on the way out grabbed me by the hand and said, love that boy. And at the time, as a father struggling with this, I thought he meant, well, that's kind of quaint to love my boy despite his idiosyncrasies. And over the course of doing this book 10 years later, talking with all other parents, a lot of child development experts, I realized I need to love my son because of what makes him different. And not despite it. And very quickly, and you go and then go on tours with him to yeah. historical places. And Including he visited with President Clinton um, and President Bush, and they both could not have been more gracious. It's a, a good reminder of how decent these men and women that we cover, that we often, people like me, get cynical about. It was a very gracious thing they both did. All right, Ron, thanks so much. Thank and you. thanks all of you so much for being with us. We'll have more with our conversation with Ron on our website, facethenation.com, and we'll be back in a moment. Donald Trump says his opponents are trying to steal the nomination. 
That was also the charge at the Republican Convention of 1952. I place before this convention for President of the United States the name of Dwight David Eisenhower. Thou shalt not steal. That's what Eisenhower's forces chanted in Chicago that summer. The accused thief? Senator Robert Taft. Taft controlled the party machinery and his allies seated his delegates instead of Eisenhower's. He rigged, deliberately rigged these bolts. All that stood between Taft and the nomination was a vote by the whole convention, okaying what the backroom boys in the credential committee had worked out for Taft. A debate raged between conservatives who backed Taft and Eisenhower, who moderates thought was more electable. I accept your summons. I will lead this crusade. It was a shocker. Taft was overthrown. In an effort to unite the party, Ike chose a rising conservative senator with sterling anti-communist credentials as his running mate, 39-year-old Richard Nixon. Ike rolled on to victory in November, and the chaos of the 1952 convention was swept aside. Republicans were happy. Conservatives were not. They would carry on the fight until they could get their own nominee 12 years later, Barry Goldwater. We'll look at his bumpy convention in 1964 in our next installment. Back in a moment. That's it for us today. Thanks for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm John Dickerson.